Um, I think you all know me, but um, uh, I'll just, for the record, say I'm Amy Skillman. I'm the director of the MA in Cultural Sustainability at Gapture College. And I want to welcome you to tonight's conversation about connecting cultural sustainability to today's educators. And as usual, before we begin, um, a, a couple of quick reminders. If you want to access closed captioning, click on the CC. I think it should be at the bottom of your screen. We are recording this. So if you prefer not to be on screen, simply turn off your video. And in the meantime, keep your microphone on mute and you could put your setting on speaker view if you want until we open it up for questions um, toward the end of our time together. Um, I will say that these events are designed as conversations. This is part of a series we've been calling Chat Fest. Um, so we, um, we have opening remarks from our speakers and then um, a dialogue, a conversation with each other. So um, please feel free to communicate with each other using the chat function. Um, if you have a question that you wanna ask, go ahead and put it in the chat so that we have it as a record, but we'll probably save it until the end. And if you like, you can go ahead right now and put something in the chat about who you are and why you're here. Um, that would be good. So this is the first session in our Spring Chat Fest series of online conversations with cultural sustainability activists. Um, our sessions are scheduled every other Tuesday from now until the end of April. And so the next one, I'm just gonna give you a quick summary of the next ones. On March 26th, it's a Tuesday night at six o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. Um, we'll have a conversation called uh, or titled Understanding Indigeneity in an Era of Decolonization. Our guest speaker will be Cynthia Vidauri. She's a folklorist in the research department of the National Museum of the American Indian um, in Washington, DC, one of the Smithsonian um, museums. And then on April 9th, also at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Sparking Community Arts for Social Change. Uh, that'll be a conversation with Asaya Kurtz, who is currently the director for Camden Fireworks in Camden, New Jersey. She's a Max alumna and um, a recipient of the Rory Turner Prize for the best capstone in cultural sustainability. So if you are a student in the program, you might wanna check out her capstone. And then finally on April 23rd at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, I will be offering an information session about the Max program which I'm calling Why Cultural Sustainability. So if any of you are new to the program or um, interested in the program, it's an opportunity to learn about the courses that we offer, the faculty that work with our students, and the kinds of careers that our students achieve. Um, past recordings of these virtual conversations can be found on our YouTube channel, or yeah, our YouTube channel, and it's called surprisingly, Cultural Sustainability at Goucher College. And Taylor is going to pop that um, link into the chat so you can go to that. These, This recording will show up there too, but it might take a little while before it gets there. Um, so, but you might wanna save that link if you like. Um, and if you want um, a list of all of the free online webinars that are happening this semester, not just in the MAX program, but in the other programs, uh, Taylor is gonna pop that link into the chat so you can grab that. Um, I would suggest you go ahead and sign up now so that it's on your calendar um, and before you forget. And then finally, um, I've asked Taylor, <clears throat> Taylor, who I'll introduce in a second, um, to put the uh, the website for the Max, the MA in Cultural Sustainability program into the chat for anybody that is interested in just checking out um, checking out our um, our program. And Taylor Seitzinger is our um, graduate admissions counselor here at Goucher College and is available to answer questions if anybody has has is interested in finding out more about admissions. 
So tonight we are exploring connections between cultural sustainability and education. We are joined by Dr. Lisa Rachi and two current Mac students, Stacy Kaler and Alicia Hinkle. Lisa is the executive director of Local Learning, the National Network for Folk Arts in Education. And uh, on their website, it says, quote, to build a more equitable and inclusive world, learners of all ages must purposefully develop the skills to recognize one another's humanity while learning more about themselves and their communities, end quote. So their work um, at Local Learning makes important connections um, between uh, that, uh, that lifelong learning process and the tenets of cultural sustainability. So Lisa's gonna talk a little bit more about her work, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about her. <clears throat> In her role um, as director of local learning, she directs teacher and artist training institutes and advocates for the inclusion of culture in diverse learning spaces. She consults nat nationally, I was gonna say naturally, she does that too, but nationally, <clears throat> and is currently involved in a five-year consultancy for the REACH program, which stands for Race, Equity, Art, and Cultural Heritage. Um, it's a program at the University of South Florida, funded by the U.S. Department of Education, designed to strengthen arts and culture programming in the nation's educational system. She directs a national consortium of folk life partners who are developing curriculum for the Library of Congress's educational programming. And with Patty Bowman, she is co-editor and founder of the Journal of uh, Folklore and Education, which I, and I will put that link in the chat in just a minute. Um, anyway, it's an international, freely accessed, multimedia juried journal. Now, after Lisa shares some of her insights, we will invite Stacy Kaler and Alicia Hinkle to tell us a little bit about their capstone work. Both of them are completing their degrees in cultural sustainability this semester at Goucher College, and both of them work in educational settings. Stacy is a librarian in the West Middle School in Carroll County, Maryland, and Alicia teaches in the social studies program at a high school. She's a high school teacher in Irving, Texas. So <clears throat> after they speak, we hope to have uh, time for about 20 minutes or so for questions and conversation at the end. So um, without further ado, let me turn it over to Lisa. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction and welcome to everyone. Um, I recognize so many of your, your faces and um, I love that. Uh, but Amy also invited you to introduce yourself in the chat and um, it would be lovely just to like know a little bit more about um, where you're from and, and also maybe what's something that you're curious about that you're hoping to kind of pay attention to tonight, think about together tonight. Um, if you want to throw those in the chat, uh, then, you know, we can take a peek as we go through um, the conversation and see where we land with that. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And like Amy said, I've prepared a couple of comments and, uh, and then hopefully we'll, it'll be enough to lead us into a pretty interesting conversation. I'm also just so excited to hear about um, the work uh, that uh, Stacy and Alicia are doing. So um, let me pull this up. Um, okay, make sure I'm not covering up my notes here. Um, and I don't know, uh, so, Patty Bowman and I had the honor of delivering a Botkin lecture earlier this year. And I've cribbed some of those notes here, but I really wanted to think about who you were in cultural sustainability. But if you watch that, um, some of this might sound a little familiar. But let me start with what is local learning? Um, I am so glad that Amy pulled that quote from our website that came out of our new strategic plan that looks to really intentionally connect all of these different threads that um, matter within folk arts education. 
from community to people, to the knowledge we hold, the traditions we practice, and how is it shared? How is it transmitted? How do we think critically about this? How do things change? How do things stay the same? And why does that matter? So Local Learning, we connect folklorists, artists, and educators across the nation and advocate for transformative learning through the inclusion of folk life and traditional arts and education for the purpose of creating intercultural understanding and building stronger communities. Uh, we began as the National Task Force for Folk Arts and Education during the 1993 Folk Arts Roundtable at the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, so uh, for 30 years, we've been doing this work. We just honored Sue Elaterio, who was a part of that initial working group uh, that said it would be a good idea to have a national network paying attention to all of the work that's going on. Um, today, the core activities and programs of local learning provide services to the field for folk arts and education and support practitioners. And that's something that I just wanna highlight as we go through the day that we are a national arts service organization. Um, so we're a 501c3, uh, but through professional development tr and training, through resources um, and through amplifying the networks and leadership around the nation that are doing this work and making sure that things stay in conversation. That's a part of the work of being a service organization. So we have developed a specific yet flexible methodology for engaging learners of all ages. Most often we share with educators through professional development, including our evidence-based culture, community, and the classroom workshop series but we've also used this with students from elementary to graduate school and in our publications, which include the Journal of Folklore and Education. In this slide, you can see the many themes that we have amplified through the volumes. Um, this year's topic, by the way, is uh, migration, disruption, and the changing contours of home. And the guest editors are Sojin Kim and alumni of the Goucher program, Michelle Banks, both of whom are at the Smithsonian. Um, JFE is a place that we would love for you to think about, um, you know, writing for, and we do have a special theme or topic every year. Um, right now we're accepting uh, articles through April 1st uh, for the topic of migration. Um, and next year, it is not officially announced, but I would love for you all to know and to be thinking about media and technology and its relationship to tradition um, in folk life education. So as I walk through the key concepts of our methods, it'll also create space for considering the deeper implications about why folk life education matters in today's complex world and its deep connection to cultural sustainability. The primary tools of folk life methodology are disarmingly simple and they can be leveled for different age groups and academic needs. At one point, I characterized this methodology as DARE, and Amy Skillman was there as we came up with this idea. What is DARE? Discover, analyze, represent, and engage. This acronym has had staying power in our professional development and work because it resonates for teachers. And, and really, that's what local learning does. We acknowledge the power of folk life methodology for learning and identify platforms and common language to share this with educators or others who want to learn with us and be with us in this work. A common misconception is that folk life education is primarily about bringing a traditional artist into the classroom or museum for them to demonstrate and share their art. While this happens, it's only the tip of the iceberg of folk life education activity. So let's look at the core concepts uh, that ground this work. First, we all have cul culture. Without doing an important work of self-discovery, guests in the classroom, such as artists, can too easily be seen through, at best, a narrow lens, and at worst, as other or reinforcing stereotype and bias. Um, so in thinking about how everyone has culture, we also want to make sure that every educator thinks about their own cultural life and their own cultural background um, and how that affects teaching and learning in their classroom. 
So I'm going to pause for just one second. And um, Katie recently played this with me. Um, but I just want to just do a quick kind of activity to get it, make sure that we're all thinking about what is culture and how does culture intersect with my work and with my life. Um, so let me just ask if anyone here is a member of a book group. Anyone here member? Book? Okay, a couple that are part of that group. Anyone here play a musical instrument or is in a musical ensemble? Okay. Um, if you have a spiritual practice, do you go for hikes? Okay. Um, anyone hunt or fish? Okay, okay. Um, who here has soup on Christmas Eve? Okay, brushes teeth with hot water? Blood. Um, and who here has used a Kaibo? Oh, I know you have. So this is a very quick game. Some of the many ways that culture, we all have folk groups, right? We all have different places where culture intersects with our lives. And this question about the Kaibo, I grew up in Iowa and the word that we always used for using um, the porta potty, the porta potty was called the Kaibo. And it wasn't until I left <laughs> and was in a different group of people. And I said, where's the Kaibo? And they looked at me like, what? What are you talking about? That I realized, oh, don't call it a Kaibo. There's so much in our own cultural vision that works invisibly. And until we have that moment where there's a discovery that oh, you mean not everybody does that? Not everybody says it that way? So one of the first challenges that I have for each of us and that I have for teachers when we're working with teachers is to ask themselves, what's your Kaibo? What's the thing that's invisible in your space because doesn't everybody do that? Doesn't everybody say that? And to begin to name that which is acting invisibly. And if I would dare push it a little further, one of the important things that we do in folk arts education and that I would charge each of you to think about in your work in cultural sustainability is in making those things that are invisible more visible. Because it is in these things that act invisibly that sometimes um, important knowledge might live traditions that matter and that we want to sustain, but it is also where bias lives. It is also where dominant narratives might live and be unquestioned because they have been invisible to too many people. So as a part of one of those first core ideas and core practices, recognizing culture is everywhere, it's in each of us, and that part of that, um, that that matters, that that's a really important part. Okay, I know I promised just 20 minutes, so I'm gonna keep going, but that is actually at the heart of so much of what we're talking about at Local Learning. So then after we think about who are we in doing this work, let's go to the second core concept, inquiry through ethnography. How can you discover more? And there's two different places that I really pay attention to as we're thinking about what is folk arts education. One, how do we discover more about ourselves, our own cultural identities? Are we an insider or an outsider to different groups? Um, having a toolkit to name our intersectionalities and I, multiple identities, inventorying our own assumptions. But two, discovering more about our community, understanding there's self, but there's group. 
And how do the stories and histories of places and people, how can we begin to bring that into the classroom, into our learning? So tools like cultural mapping, oral history, guest artists, interviews, all of this becomes a part of that toolkit to think about engaging inquiry through ethnography. So I'll end this, this bullet point saying many educators are talking about culturally responsive teaching and curriculum. Before that, it was multicultural education, but there's not enough scaffolding or tools, this is my opinion, there's not enough scaffolding or tools to understand how we discover what the culture of our students might be or how they might be able to have agency in sharing and learning about themselves. This is part of why folk life education matters. So I also hope that you're paying attention to the fact that this is like working in some really dynamic spaces. As we talk about ourselves as we talk about groups, as we talk about their intersections, it becomes an iterative process of discovery. And recognizing the iterative process of learning about oneself and culture means that reflection needs to be built into any folk arts education process. And that products are simply an opportunity to create new questions. So let's go back to the assumption uh, that much of folk arts education might involve bringing guests into the classroom, guest artists, uh, guest culture bearers. And I would suggest that all three of the first bullet points on this list would need to be addressed in pre-work and any work that we are doing so that when we bring guests into the classroom, it can be rewarding and it can extend beyond a stage presentation. We acknowledge the power of the artist or tradition bearer immediately showing students it, what it is they know, but that first presentation can just be the hook to spark wonder and curiosity. And then when students can be prepared, they can engage inquiry through ethnographically based interviews and documentation to create a chance for students to gain an appreciation of the context of what they just experienced. So Amy mentioned that this year um, we've been working with teaching with primary sources, a program of the Library of Congress. And this idea of documentation and ethnography um, is core to folk life education and the discipline of folk life. Um, and because it is core, there's all these collections, all these archives around the nation and at the American Folk Life Center that can be accessed by teachers for the purposes of bringing new voices into the classroom that might not show up in corporate classroom textbooks. Which brings me to that fourth bullet point, representation through the archives. Um, and so I'm just showing a quick screenshot of a curriculum guide uh, that we uh, developed in the past two years of the Teaching with Primary Sources program. So just to briefly say, Primary sources that come from ethnography and oral history offer access to diverse perspectives on topics that have significance for the hyper-local, yet they can extend to deep global and historical connections. Folk sources, as I'm calling them, can spark curiosity and offer opportunities for inquiry. They can teach us new narratives about a time, a place, or an event. They can also complicate a story. So the process of ethnography and documentation provides tools for ethical collaboration and connection within communities. The products of the process matter because they are texts that are necessary for deeper understanding of ourselves, our communities, and our histories. Um, but this isn't just about the record for people who didn't experience that event, that place, or that time. Primary sources also save things for the community. People can access their own story that is otherwise lost or not amplified through formal education or dominant narratives. Youth, and I would argue learners of all ages, pay attention to what is valued by society and seeing a record of their community stories as text that should be taught matters. So for local learning, Teaching with folk sources has mattered because the critical analysis of these texts offers opportunities 
to consider significant topics in social studies, literacy, and civics like subject position, multiple truths, the complexity of memory, and the ways we need all these diverse and sometimes contradictory stories to understand where we have been to better chart our future. And um, I just wanna briefly show this chart. This was one of the pieces that um, was published in this year's Journal of Folklore and Education on teaching with folk sources. And just thinking about how to be mindful of cultivating with intention um, the process for this work that's been honed over decades by folk art education specialists to include knowledge from diverse cultural communities and how it can be transferred to a variety of contexts. Um, and I'm gonna quote Thomas Grant Richardson from the most recent Journal of American Folklore. He writes, I believe a significant concern to our own disciplinary relevance is how well equipped we are to meet the unexpected challenges of the moment. As a field, I believe we can bridge the gap between immediate action and thoughtful analysis so that the chasm continues to shrink, giving us smarter, better, and more sustainable tools to move forward in this world where calamity and inequity continue to fester. Why shrink from the challenge of being cultural first responders equipped with an intellectual and practical toolkit that not only extinguishes the current figurative or literal fire, but also enabled us, enables us to help ensure that those fires won't rage again. Likewise, Emily Hilliard's call in this, uh, this was a 2023 uh, Journal of American Folklore uh, for Visionary Folklore affirms the role of cultural heritage in shaping future. I think teachers are first responders and education is aligned with first responders. They, teachers are the first to know when something is changing or having an effect negative or positive in their communities. They are the canaries in the mines. With folk life methodology, we're able to create an iterative dynamic and critical space for naming those challenges and opportunities and generating additional knowledge and narratives around that idea Folk life education also centers context as a key term for building critical and cultural literacy through guest artists, primary sources, and a personal expo exploration of one's self or community. So I think I'm going to pause there and just say those are a couple of ideas that I wanted to like kind of pull from the many threads of things that we're working on from local learning and how it all connects to that core methodology. Um, and hopefully you saw a lot of interesting threads that you would wanna pull in your own practice within cultural sustainability. So I'm gonna end there and pass the ball back over to Amy. Oh, and you're muted. Got it, got it. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, lots of lots of nuggets in in that presentation. I think lots of uh, lots lots of stuff to kind of tease apart. Um, but before we do, let's let's um, switch it over to Stacy. Um, would you like to go first, or should Alicia go first? Actually, Alicia probably always goes first because her first name starts with an A. So let's have Stacy go first, just to shake it up. Okay. Um, <laughs> So um, both Alicia and Stacy have been working, as I said, on their capstones, um, and both of them are in education. So I'm really, uh, so we wanted them to just kind of share a little bit about what they're doing and, and how it connects. So Stacy, you want to go? Sure. Um, and I wrote all mine down so that I didn't forget anything. So <laughs> that's how I'm going to present it. Um, so in the article, Cultural Sustainability, a Framework for Relationships, Understanding, and Action, Mason and Turner state that cultural sustainability is the ability to affect positive community-driven change in the cultures you care most about. 
The culture I care most about is the middle school in which I work and more broadly, the county where I teach. When I started this program, I had been a school librarian for 12 years, working first in elementary school and then in middle school. COVID hit March, in March, and that summer in my first class, Cultural Sustainability, we watched a video of Brene Brown talking about the power of vulnerability, and it made me think about the importance of stories and belonging. Throughout my coursework, I have been looking through the lens, looking at everything through the lens of belonging. My coursework has allowed me to realize that my identity and the way I experience things impact the way I belong and interact with others. I can now see how cultural policies can also impact belonging, such as when my County Board of Education banned all flags after a community organization donated pride flags to the schools and the creation of a special county health curriculum that skirts around gender identity. I was also able to dig into the concept of belonging through my independent study of belonging. This was important because my professors were not going to let me get away with, you know, belonging is belonging. They wanted me to dig in more. <laughs> um, so through, through that study, I realized that belonging may mean different things to different people, but from what I researched, to me, it means being authentic with who you are and your community will support, protect, accept, and walk alongside you to work for a greater purpose, whatever that may be. So I knew my task was to cultivate belonging in the middle school setting, and I approached it the only way I knew how. I created lessons, gathered students, and taught and discussed belonging. I luckily have the full support of my administration because school culture is a priority now, it is not always, and belonging actually fits into the mind-brain education push that our school has been working toward. I have been learning officially because I'm pretty sure I knew this, but never really articulated it or thought about it through Whitman and Kelleher's NeuroTeach that relationships are the key to learning, that stress inhibits the everyday long-term memory formation that is crucial to learning, and identity threat creates toxic stress that inhibits learning. Feeling a sense of belonging, I believe, strengthens your identity and lowers stress, which positively impacts learning. Today was the last day of the 13 lessons that I facilitated, and to say that I am overwhelmed is an understatement. Mm -hmm. I am mostly overwhelmed by the grace and thoughtfulness of the students. Together, we started off with creating agreements to make sure everyone felt heard. We read a book called A Kid's Book About Belonging by Kevin Carroll. We created identity trees and talked about the importance of being true to who you are and the difference between belonging and fitting in. The identity trees help show the kids that they are known and accepted. We then created a map of the school that showed us places where we belong and talked about why those places made an impact and are special. We played a cooperative game where each student had a purpose. We discussed belonging while looking at pictures to give us visuals, and we created a timeline where we talked about the times during our middle school years where we felt like we belonged most. We talked about identity again when we gave each other compliments and told each other what we feel is a positive trait they show. And we ended today creating simple action plans on how to cultivate belonging in our school. For one of our lesson exit tickets, students had to fill out this sentence, belonging looks like blank because of blank. I got that from a book, I didn't make that up. <laughs> um, the kids all came up with different things, but someone stated that belonging looks like getting along. I can totally see how they would look at it that way. So I pushed back on them and asked if we are getting along all the time. I wonder if that is like putting on a mask so that people don't really see what you really think and feel. What do you think? One student said, I think if you're always trying to get along and not expressing what you're feeling, then that is not a healthy relationship. You can express that you have different opinions or if you're not getting along or not agreeing with each other. It's what you do to come back together and figure it out. That is what makes you belong. This is why cultural sustainability belongs in the classroom. In a time where as a nation, we are politically divided, school library books are being attacked and banned, we need more of the coming back together and figuring it out. Thanks.
Thank you. Excellent. So, um, okay, Raina, it looks, oh, okay. You were doing clapping, not, not raising your hand. Awesome. So if you have a question for Stacy, hold it. Um, and let's let, Ali is that okay? Let's let Alicia go then. And then we'll just open it up for questions and, and conversation. So Alicia, add, okay. let's add, add your kind of vision and insight. And this is just going to be an amazing conversation. Okay. Um, that was great, Stacy. And unlike Stacy, I did not write everything down. So <laughs> I'm just going to dive into um, the capstone that I am working on. And it has been a journey. So to uh, briefly start, when I first had interest in the MAX program, I was diving into my heritage and um, my culture. And it really led me down a road towards preservation of cemeteries. Now, as I went through the program, um, other things began to pop up and piqued my interest. And as a person in education teaching history in Texas, uh, what stood out recently is a man named William J. Durham, who is an African-American, or excuse me, was an African-American um, attorney, or I guess you could say is, in Sherman, Texas. And the reason why I bring that up is because I'm in Dallas County. I teach in Irving, Texas. However, my family is from Sherman, Texas. And there is a pivotal landmark case that William J. Durham is a part of that I never knew while teaching this history in the state of Texas. Um, and that was that he was tied to the landmark, um, one of the landmark cases, Sweat v. Painter, which led to integration of the University of Texas in 1950 and integration of other high schools and even pay rates for educators and such um, compensation uh, for African-Americans, the disparities between them in the state of Texas um, four years before Brown v. Board of Education, um, or Brown v. Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas. So what I'm diving into right now is working on curriculum to um, enhance the experiences, or I should say the, the resources that teachers in Texas may have with regard to a course that is now available, African American Studies in Texas, which is a... Um, semester elective. Now, the biggest issue with this, and I have um, curriculum within my district, but the biggest issue is that there's not much of curriculum around this course, um, which leads a lot of, uh, you know, decisions up to the educators and, you know, just kind of blind spots and what can I find. Um, so how does this tie back into cultural sustainability? Well, I'm able to dive into um, oral history, which is really the, the main focus of documentation and um, archives of research to provide project-based learning curriculum within the classroom for students. And I do work primarily in the high school and that's what I'm focused on right now, although this may evolve. With the curriculum that's being developed, the research is necessary. And through the studies that I've found, uh, the grandnephew of William J. Durham is alive and well and will be a part of the oral history uh, that will take place actually during this week, as well as other individuals who integrated schools in Sherman, Texas and beyond. Um, so again, the main focus is North Texas right now. And with these interviews, the research is to provide primary sources, which I saw Lisa was mentioning a bit more, um, but also local heritage and um, more, uh, in, in my opinion, just the ability of students to relate to what's happening in their community, a bit more in their region and in the state. And interestingly enough, I Sue is my advisor and I talked to her about our state standards that we have in Texas. And for African-American studies, the court case is there and it's uh, civil rights information is tied within our, um, what we call TEKS, Texas Essential uh, Knowledge and Skills Standard. What's missing, some words like integration, um, segregation, and other details that really dive into the story and again are left up to whoever may be based into that, that subject, willing to, to, to dive into that or not. Um, so I'm really excited about what will evolve within this research and how for so long, myself included, that I'm teaching um, a, a core subject, U.S. history star related course for us. That's our state standard testing. 
And I going into this content, I just had no idea that Sweat v. Painter, um, the lead attorney was William Durham, someone from uh, the region where my mother was raised and other individuals, you know, so I felt some way, you know, I had to acknowledge myself in, in this research, but I also looked at it as what can I do? How can I make this uh, a bit more relatable, not only for the teachers, but also for the students and also give them a sense of um, ownership and accountability to create their own local oral history projects within this curriculum as well. So I'm excited about um, where this journey has brought me. I know that there are some ethical considerations um, that may uh, occur, including, you know, how this might be harsh histories within those interviews um, and getting multiple sides of their perspective of integration from the African-American community. So um, that's a little bit about my topic. Uh, again, I'm diving into this attorney, William J. Durham. Um, it led me down this road of how can I engage more with students? How can I bring more um, projects into the classroom or resources? And uh, Lisa, I've been taking notes because I love what you're doing. And I'm I'm really just excited about what this will what will become of this and beyond. So that's a bit about my capstone. And thank you all. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Alicia. What a great um, kind of example of, um, you know, using your cultural sustainability methodologies to do your research, but then also designing curriculum for both of you, designing curriculum that um, it also embeds some of the tenets of, of cultural sustainability um, in, into, uh, let, uh, into encouraging I think students to, con I mean, to connect the personal to, to education um, is also a really um, important way to, for people to remember things, right? I mean, they'll, they'll remember those stories if they, if they connect to a place they grew up or somebody they know or an experience they heard about or that sort of thing. So, so um how about we open it up for questions or comments or additional um, experiences and thoughts if anybody wants to share? Who has a question? I, I, do, have a, I do have a question. First, I wanna thank um, all, uh, all the presenters. Um, this has been uh, quite enriching my 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 pages uh, full of full of notes. My question is for uh, Dr. Uh, Rothchi. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Rothchi? Rothchi. Okay. okay, great, great. Uh, well, well, well. You know, as has already been mentioned, you know, these what's happening. This is certainly a critical time in education nationally, with the you know with the education being attacked in ways that it never has been before. You know, and as we think about some of these anti CRT CRT laws. Um, I'm curious if you if you are seeing if you notice that there are any issues implementing um, what you refer to as culturally responsive teaching um, in some of these states that have uh, passed these laws, um, and then also you know what how can an instructor how can an instructor create equity through folk life art um, under these conditions? What what would that look like? That's the question that matters so much right now. Um, thank you for asking it. Um, so I'm gonna put just a link because I also was thinking of this when Alicia was talking. Um, one of my partners this past year, Sinead Renowell, um, wrote an article that I've been asking her to write for a very long time. She um, is an educator, um, a teacher of teachers, pre-service teachers at Oklahoma State University um, and is trained as a cultural geographer. She's also on the board of local learning. And um, she was working with me on teaching the Tulsa race massacre and was talking about how she talks to pre-service teachers about some of these exact questions that, that you are asking, Brandon, Brandel. And um, in this particular article, it starts to get at like, what are some of the ways that she um, prompts students to evaluate their thinking and biases before entering challenging conversations? 
So that's like, like there's a couple of like really useful scaffolded steps that she provides in that article. So that's like one place where I've gone, okay, that's, that's like a specific tool. But now let's step back to the bigger questions that you're asking. Um, again, from Shanidra, one of the things that I've learned and, uh, you know, and I'm hearing it, Alicia, and what you're talking about is about the standards and the standards need to be taught. Um, in Oklahoma, the, there is a standard that says you need to teach the Tulsa race massacre. So, you know, how do you do that then? Um, you know, that's where the protection was for teachers. Um, and looking at those standards and being able to say, this, this is something I need to teach. Um, so that's like a second part, like knowing the standards, knowing how the critical material that matters needs to be taught. And that's like, that's a very specific way to, to push back on some of this new legislation that is ignoring existing law and existing standards that's out there, right? So like, but that's another space to work. But the third way to, to think about this, um, just to be, practical about it, to like take care of ourselves about it, um, is to also think, so where are the pathways to, well, you know, I'm thinking about belonging. I'm thinking about what you were just thinking about, Stacey. Like, how are we approaching this through a trauma-informed approach? How are we approaching this through a people-centered approach? And that's why I think the fact that we're working in this intersection of culture really matters. Um, you'll notice that this curriculum guide, and, and feel free to push back. Maybe like maybe we went too far, but you'll notice this curriculum guide is called Teaching with Folk Sources. Our initial project was not named Teaching with Folk Sources. Our initial project was named something like challenging history, teaching with counter narratives, something like that. Um, and, you know, we had partners in Florida, in Oklahoma, in Vermont, Vermont, you could still do it. <laughs> um, you know, but you see what I'm saying. So we're like, oh, how do we even get this material in the front door? Um, and it's still true. We're teaching with folk sources. And Somebody might not know what folk sources is, uh, and that's okay. Then we're gonna like come in and we're gonna do this. There's a lot of doors that I get get in by saying I'm a folklorist and not saying I'm an activist. Um, you know, and so we each have like different ways in the door, um, but we have the core methodologies then that are about relationship, about culture about critical thinking. And that's like the, I don't know, where am I at? The third or the fourth point. Um, <laughs> thinking about critical thinking as being integral to any of the work that we are doing. Um, so no matter what kind of text that we're looking at, how, I mean, even our youngest learners, they can look at something and think about it critically from you know where they are sitting. Um, you're with a bunch of second graders and you share, you know, something, they're going to give you a lot of opinions. And a lot of those opinions are straight up critical thinking. So making sure that we keep that curiosity, that inquiry is a big part of it all the way through that learning. Um, but then the last thing I would say, like, we also just have to take care of ourselves, take care of our teachers. Um, what are we doing to show them that they're seen, that they're supported? Um, when I did a presentation in Miami Dade for 200 educators last summer, um, the topic was the, looking at Cuba and uh, the Peter Pan generation. And I pulled out a couple of lullabies from the American Folklife Center collection. Um, and we were looking at, you know, like the story of the lullaby and how certain lullabies change as um, to like take in like the challenge and the significance of kids who were put on planes by their parents to, to save them from uh, communism. And 
I had teachers come up to me afterwards. They're like, this is such a great activity. But every single primary source that you pulled out is going to be called a text. And every text has to go in front of our parent review committee. And so now a teacher, like the onus is on them to like bring six texts for review and, or they could just take the Houghton Mifflin textbook that's already been pre-stamped and approved and just have that in the classroom. So like, this is the challenge. So like, okay, how do we do navigate that? There's not a good answer for every one of these situations, except to like say, also, we see you teachers, we see what's going on and we're gonna be working every angle from an advocacy and policy angle to also support what's going on in that classroom because, you know, they're scared, some of them. Sue. Well, I, <clears throat> I wanted to give Alicia and Stacy a chance to talk first. To that, to respond to that question first, I can give you a short uh, response. It was kind of um, added in with what Lisa said. You have to know the standards, and um, that's the biggest workaround. Is that although it may be broad, um, if you know what you are required to teach within your content. Um, and again, I'm in Texas, so <laughs> it's a lot going on. But if you know what you are um, able to teach, what you're responsible for teaching, you still have the duty to teach your children. Now, um, that's a part of my project. My capstone is providing more resources that really can help because just, you know, we have educators and we have plenty that are qualified, but that doesn't mean they're the absolute expert on every single topic, um, specifically speaking on mine with African-American studies that I'm focusing on. So the um, ability to kind of work beyond uh, looking at what you have in front of you, looking at, okay, this is my end goal, but also acknowledging that I know you've mentioned, you know, and there's a lot of conversation on culturally responsive teaching within the classroom. Um, and I've been to meetings with other educators where they really don't like to touch on harsh histories. Um, and a part of that is conquering, you know, this, the bias that you might have on your own, but also understanding that you're needing to facilitate your classroom environment in a way that does Lisa mentioned it, provide um, inquiry. You have students feeling comfortable with asking questions. It's tied to management as well. Um, and just doing the best with with what you can, with, with what you have in front of you. But my sentiments are really close to what Lisa says. And again, although it's challenging times in the state, I'm very aware of what I'm required to teach and what we have available. And I can dive into that and work around certain things because here's my reference, right? This is what you put in our state guidelines. And this is still what I'm tackling, you know, ABC and on. That would be my little tidbit. Yeah, my tidbit is that, um, you know, I really felt when Lisa said, you know, the teachers need to be seen and heard. Um, in my county, we have a very um, vocal parent group who has like, that's impacted the libraries in our county because they have, uh, they have gone into like this website called Book Looks and they have uh, like flagged like so many books. So 60 books have been challenged in our county that we can't keep up. So they've removed them from the shelves. Um, and that has like, that has really brought down policy that nobody has talked to librarians about. Um, our library supervisor was removed from her position. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on that aren't being very transparent. Um, and it's really a sticky situation right now. And it's a little scary and you don't know who um, has your back. And it's really disheartening when you feel like your county does not have your back. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> and Stacey, can I add one, just what you said, because in Texas, we cannot have, um, we don't have unions. So it's hard for teachers because many of them do not want to be the face, unfortunately. 
and go step in front of a school board or whoever it might be and provide here the resources. Um, we're working with that. We have associations that are definitely doing their part and going to Austin very frequently. Um, but I think that's the biggest challenge, even if you do have a union, you know, who wants to be the face? Because with our contracts, it's typically, you know, some they've moved to a year and some places might still have more than that. But there's always a fear, although it shouldn't be one, that, OK, now I'm on this blacklist and now I have to, you know, tread carefully because of what I'm challenging, even if I have the proof. And that's the unfortunate reality. Again, um, working with organizations that you can and associations for myself, being a part of many of those um, definitely helps out. But I hear you, Stacey. It's an unfortunate reality in, in the educational world right now. And the one other thing I'd add, um, having been a classroom teacher, is that, um, and all three of the speakers have kind of spoken to this, but pay attention to the culture of the community you're working with. So um, years ago, when I taught ninth grade, we had the kids document Halloween practices, and I had kids who were Jehovah's Witnesses in my class. And Jehovah's Witness kids, at least back in the day, were not allowed to really talk about Halloween or look at Halloween. So what I had them do as an assignment was write about Jehovah's Witness belief. Um, and their parents were fine with that. Um, so I, I think flexibility is is a is a is a big role in this work um, and paying attention to everybody's culture um, and and finding ways that acknowledge that culture. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm wearing my ACLU band books t-shirt, um, which I wear because I think it helps promote the idea that, you know, that there are people who are willing to read band books and I'm relatively safe because I'm not teaching in high school at the moment. But anyway, so I, I would just add that to uh, what everybody has already said. Well, that's, um, Lisa had talked about, um, this idea of multiple truths. And, it, you know, I, and then years ago, talking about Halloween in the classroom might have been okay. But, you know, there's there's so much, um, so many different perspectives to pay attention to, right? That, um, that being flexible and trying to figure out how you, how you adjust um, in order to also let those students see and respect that diversity. So, you know, do the, do the Jehovah's Witness kids end up being feeling ostracized or feeling um, teased? Do they get teased or feeling um, different? Or do they get, do they end up feeling like, well, this is, this is what is important to me, right? And yeah, so I think that's one of the challenges too. Other questions or comments? John. Yeah, I wanted to reiterate what Randall said first of all, which is, you know, thank you to all of you for these presentations and particularly Stacy and Alicia, thank you for sharing your capstones because I imagine it's scary. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my question is for for all three of you because I think you would all have very different and knowledgeable answers to this. Um, Lisa, you know this, but I work for an organization called Rivers of Steel, which does like part of what my company does is bring artists into classrooms in the sort of traditional like folk arts education way that you talked about, and. I struggle a lot with how do we do that in a way that isn't just focused on the product of teaching art. And a, a comment you made, Alicia, about how your teachers don't have unions struck me. And like the, I don't know, trying to think of how, what are ways that I, as an outsider, whether I'm attached to an organization or I'm just someone you're collaborating with, how can I help to? support teachers, support librarians when working with them. If that makes sense. Uh, 
I can um, touch on that a little bit. And I would mention, um, I know it's te Texas is different, but we do have multiple partnerships and we always seek um, opportunities within the community with various groups and organizations. Um, it's not as complicated unless you try to push it at a district level. So my suggestion is starting with maybe one specific campus and one school. Um, and that's really getting your foot in the door because then you're providing, you know, here's this, you know, service I provide, or maybe I can do this after school with students if you would allow me and you're networking with whoever might be in that specific content that you want to focus on. Um, that really gets your foot in the door. Then the next step in, in kind of working with my district and what I'm thinking about um, is that you collaborate on ways that can help enhance um, projects and other events that the school has anyway. For example, they might have a competition. They're like, oh, great. You know, I can provide this with your students after school, if you wouldn't mind. Um, then you're getting yourself a little bit more notice within the district. And that helps bridge that gap, but also provide, you know, show them that you are a community partner. Um, you are just as much as a steward as anyone else as a teacher within the classroom. And even within the associations that we have, when we have events, when we have, you know, just thinking sports for a minute, games, we love to see other individuals show up, other community members, because it's not just about isolating the student body. And this is what happens. Every school has a mission and most mission statements have something in there or we're trying to make them global citizens, you know, and that's where those partnerships kind of tie in. It does take a little bit of legwork, but I promise you, you know, once you get that person, you're like, okay, what can we do? And teachers like, like myself, we're looking for that because I'm like, oh, all right, I have somebody in the community. Um, they're willing to partner with me on this. It really gives you an extra, you know, check on that box. If you already know what standard you're focused on, because every, you know, from art to music to whatever, to history, we all have a standard. So if you can say, I would love to, and just send it out to a couple of, you know, you can hit up a couple of schools and they show you their entire list of, you know, teachers in certain fields or certain contents. And someone, it's just like cold calling, someone will reach out and say, oh, that's great. You know, I'd love to have you in doing this. Um, that's just my note for you on part, forming a partnership on getting with in the school district. Um, but we love that support. Speaking for on behalf of educators, we love to see communities get involved and um, continue to help us because ultimately you're helping the students um, just become better as a whole. So I, I hope I'm answering a little bit of your question, if not most of it. <laughs> Um, my thought is, I'm not quite sure what you're doing, but maybe like have an open house for teachers and do like a workshop with them and, you know, have it be like bring your own beer or something because we like to drink, especially on a Friday. Um, so <laughs> make it fun. <laughs> um, and I think that would get people interested and in being like, yeah, this will be fun for the kids. And this is something that can build community with the kids. Um, so I don't know if that works, but. I always like alcohol sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so now I know local learning doesn't have enough beer at our workshops. <laughs> oh, I think you got to so work on that, Lisa. I wonder if, can you get a grant to do that? Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, I want to underscore what Alicia said about starting with that one and you said one school, but then you even refined it more. And I think this is appropriate, that one teacher. Like who is the individual that you're specifically connecting with? Uh, when we think in like kind of that it's just a big organization or it's just an entity, uh, you lose the, the relationship piece of it and the person who's actually gonna help open the door. Um, and, you know, in our culture community, in the classroom program uh, that is particularly in upstate New York, uh, but we've been extending it into other places. Um, we It's a three-part workshop series, learn, practice, share. And that learning part, the professional development part, um, we do have food, even though we don't have alcohol, but we're bringing 
the teachers and artists that um, want to work together together for the training and and it's all asset based and that's maybe the other thing to like kind of realize when you're a community member uh, maybe you're coming from a museum or a cultural organization or you're an artist yourself or a theater um, you're like I want to work in these schools you know like thinking about kind of how the teachers can bring expertise into um, that learning, everything that the teachers know, you're bringing community-based expertise or an art discipline-based expertise, and how can you each bring that expertise to bear on an amazing opportunity for those students? Um, so that's something that I really focus on in culture, community, in the classroom, but I think it's a model that works in so many other spaces. Other comments or questions? Or oh yeah, Jenny. Hi, um, I was gonna obviously say thank you very much as well from y'all. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion. I have a question about how for you, um, Lisa, and, and I think it's be, be pertinent. How how do you find the projects that you work on? Do they find you? Do you find them? Who connects you? Um, where do you actually find the most success? Is it is it a charter school? Is it a public school? Is it a private school? Is it a, is it a parent? Like, how do you kind of find where it's been the most success? Um, and it's, it's sort of worked and where are those sort of areas, you know, a, a, I know it's national, but I would imagine there are pockets that you sort of have very effective programming in places that there may be sort of black holes where that program isn't necessarily there. And I'd be curious, those places that you think need your work the most, how, would you reach them if they are not necessarily coming to you? So that is a great question. And um, and we are national. And honestly, so much of our work is about services, resources, and training for those that are working in schools and with schools that we don't have the outside of culture, community, in the classroom. We are not doing direct service um, education at all. So um, we are looking to engage leaders and mentor leaders and build up those nodes of people doing folk arts education around the nation. So um, it looks different in every space. So in Miami, working with a museum uh, to develop, you know, their arts residency program for schools in Miami-Dade County, but also a story sharing kit in um, Oklahoma, working with uh, Shanidra and pre-service teachers, but then there's also lots of teachers that have been piloting our materials. Um, so that looks that kind of a way. Um, then lots of different organizations that are looking to do this and us doing consultation with them. So they come to us and they're like, how can we develop this program? And then, so Amy said, I also used to teach in the, the MAX program. And one of the courses I taught was cultural partnerships. Honestly, a lot of the, the work that we do looks just like cultural partnerships. How can we connect community and school and culture bearers or traditional artists in that kind of triangle in these different spaces? Um, and it looks different in every single space. So your question, like most directly, like we're usually invited in. Someone calls us and says, we want to do this in our community. And we set up a consultancy and then we sit down, but every consultancy is different because everyone has a different vision. What is it that you want to accomplish? Um, so first we have to make sure we're all on the same page. And then secondly, um, every ecosystem is different. What's going on in your school? Do you have any partners already in the schools? Um, oh, you have a kid in the school and you have a great teacher. Excellent. You know, like finding like, again, those like personal relationships and then does that partner that you have in the school have the same vision for what would be awesome as you do? They might 
they might be an awesome teacher and not have the same vision that you do. Like, okay, that might not be the right path to achieve the goals that you have in your mind. Are you going to change your goals a little bit now that you've heard their perspective? Um, you know, visions can shift once you learn more and there's discovery or you realize, oh, that's not the right partner. This isn't the right school or the right time, uh, you know, and you keep kind of working to develop it. The one place, and we call this kind of our, our test kitchen where local learning isn't necessarily invited in because almost all of our work is that people have asked us to come is in upstate New York. Um, and there we do fundraising uh, to run our culture community in the classroom program. And this will be our seventh year. And it's been so special <laughs> in some ways to have a program where we aren't the consultant just listening to how we could create these spaces that work in that community that we're really designing from the ground up and getting to like play and create our data and understand what works and what doesn't work in doing this. And so in that case, you know, we understand a lot more about the ecosystems from the infrastructure, like the Board of Cooperative Educational, uh, Board, BOCI, Board of Cooperative Educational Services and the teacher centers. And then we also have folklorists that are from their decentralized network that are on the ground. We have a lot of artists. And so we're able to kind of put all these pieces together. And then that's where we develop more activities, more curriculum, more ideas for training and resources. And then we get lots of evaluation because we <laughs> like we know where we started. We know what the, we ended up with. We have these evaluations for impact. And then that's what we take back out when people ask us to do another consultancy. Um, so anyway, our system is a little bit different since we are a national service org, um, but we're like helping people ask, answer the same questions that you're asking because it just looks different in every single space. And the reasons why you're asking that question often look different in every single space. Like what, why does the community member want to be in the school? Why does the school want interaction from local artists? Um, what is it that the teachers want? You know, finding that common ground is the most important place to start for any of it. So I feel like I danced around your question, but do you have a follow-up question given the, <laughs> the kind of like, well, we don't dance. exactly do that, but there's a lot of different ways into it. It's cultural partnerships over and over and over again. Sue, taught, Sue and I taught that together for a while. It's all the same language. Yeah. Any other questions, thoughts? You know, I love this idea of um, cultural first responders. Um, and I'm wondering if if anybody wants to kind of riff on that for a little bit, you know? Um, and I saw Alicia, kind of her face lit up when you were saying that, Lisa. So. Um, I, you know, I wondered if we could, if you have kind of more thoughts about that, about how do you, and, and I guess part of, part of that is then how do we empower teachers to be that or to, to, um, to recognize and understand that the, the potential for that role as being that role. I don't have anything deep um, to say about that, but it, it made my eyes light up too uh, when that um, analogy was made because you really are the people who are running into the burning building to save the children. Mm -hmm. uh, and people, I think many people don't even recognize that there's smoke coming out of it. Um, but that's but that's really, you know, what it is. And you're right that it's the teacher's I think particularly, I don't know, I'm not an educator. I was just, you know, a student at one time at the, at the younger uh, levels, they do know when something is changing 
And a lot of times they are, you know, the first place that a child will go, you know, to talk about, uh, you know, what what their concerns might be or what their ideas might be, because, you know, it's not all trouble, you know, some, mm -hmm. sometimes they have some good ideas. So I, I do appreciate that. Um, and um, but thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate you. I appreciate your um, reminder that it's not all trouble either, you know, that some of the coolest new ideas come out of um, uh, of stu ch children at school, right? Being at school. Randall and then John. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought us back to this, uh, Amy, because that, that phrase, um, uh, uh, resonated with me as well. I can just say it, it resonated to me because I was thinking about my personal experience being I was raised in a very conservative environment in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, and as a uh, black gay boy learning to learning about my identity, um, uh, I was I was fortunate to to have uh, two two uh, independent writing it, two independent studies with an excellent uh, writing teacher in the writing center. Um, and I think that she saw that I was sort of struggling with my identity. And so she she assigned me Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass and Ralph Ellison's In Invisible Man at the same time. <laughs> and and this was in my my junior and senior years of high school. And, you know, that those 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 bo both of those both of those works uh, really helped to, to to help me shape really helped to um uh, helped me to accept my identity, helped me to, I think, develop at a critical, of that critical moment in my life. Um, and so that teacher that I'm still in touch with today, um, she was, I was very much so a first responder for me. She got me in a way that even my family didn't. So yeah, that, that, that comment, uh, that, that phrase, uh, uh, it's, it certainly rings true to me. Yeah, because you, you know, you can see what's going on with your own child at home, but the teacher sees what's going on, you know, that it's that there are four or five or six or eight children going through a similar kind of, um, I mean, yeah, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. whatever it is. Yeah, John. Um, you know, I'm thinking about this idea more, and I'm particularly thinking about Alicia and, and Lisa and Stacy, the advice you gave me to my earlier question. There's this group in town in Pittsburgh here. Um, that I admire a lot called LIGHT, um, which is this experimental education initiative that we've been working with. I won't bother explaining the nitty gritty, but what I really admire about them is they, they operate from a similar philosophy of like elementary and middle school teachers are those first responders. They are the people who know what kids' concerns are, particularly in like a civics classroom, um, which is their main focus. And so they have these curriculums where they go, okay, let's take elementary school kids, middle school kids on field trips and um, to meet community members that answer specific local histories and local needs, and then get them to start a club in high school that is based on one of those things. So like, for example, we've been working with them to take kids to old steel mills and talk about how the collapse of the steel industry affected their community. Um, and then the idea is we'll introduce them to like the local politicians in these steel towns and like, you know, steel workers and all of these people that can speak to a history they're connected to and then offer to them, okay, now you go make some kind of Boy Scout-esque you know, uh, Eagle Scout graduation project, civics project based on that. This is all they're doing, not mine or my company's. But I I really admire that because it takes that first responder impulse and then acts on that to go, okay, now that I now that I know this about you and I can help you with this, how do I empower you, you know, across your whole education to act on that concern or that belief or problem you're having? I think that brings up a, a really interesting point too about um, educational 
and cultural first responder opportunities outside the education system. You know, what are the what are the after school programs that kids are involved in, and what are the alternative ed programs that kids are involved in, and what are the um, yeah the scouts and the, all of those and and um, and I and in some ways I feel like historically those have been not all of them. Those have been the places where this kind of work can happen, but where it needs to happen is in the school. And so, you know, how can you create partnerships um, that that it, that um, facilitate those connections for the school so that it's not like this added burden too? Because I know that's historically been an issue too is, oh no, I've got too much to do. Don't bring me something else, right? Well, that speaks to Jenny's question a little bit, like where can this really happen? Can yeah. it, you know, is it better to do this or easier to do this in a museum or mm -hmm. in an after school program, more informal learning as opposed to formal learning? Um, but John, what I love and what you've described, um, it's it's got such a long view of the student. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, something that I find challenging is that there's a lot of compartmentalization of students as they go on their educational journey. Um, and that's like saying, oh, you are a whole learner and I see you now second grader and you're gonna keep learning. And when you are reaching this age, you're gonna bring that learning to bear on this question or this community idea. Um, so there's something really cool about that. And if any of the rest of you are captivated with this as like kind of an idea, like how do we get at the whole child? Um, uh, I will just say that the Folk Arts Cultural Treasure School in Philadelphia uh, this is where I first experienced the spiral curriculum. Is, it, is that familiar to to folks in this this space? It was totally new to me, and I I am kind of obsessed with this idea. Um, so they have a spiral curriculum that they designed with Losang Sam Ten, and it was a K through eight eight week curriculum, one week a year. So they bring the same artist every year. And those students should in theory then work with that same artist for one week every year. And they are gonna be working with him, you know, from first grade, eighth grade or kindergarten, eighth grade, I don't remember which, but there's an intentional curriculum that's a spiral. And how are they building on the core learning objectives every year of this eight week curriculum that takes eight years or eight week curriculum that takes eight years to complete. Yeah. Um, and to me, that just gets at something that's missing in a lot of the ways that we think about this work. And I think especially for those of you that are working in community-based organizations or in, uh, you know, or in an artist, um, to think about that spiral curriculum and how you're thinking about that whole student and seeing their agency and growth as something that matters to you over more than that one time residency could be a way to sustain your practice. The school's gonna want you to keep returning if you've got like a vision for how this is gonna continue, right? But I think it's also really important for you and for that student to have that long view. I don't know. There's just so anyway, John, thank you for reminding me of that. And I think that that's just such a a radical way that's also completely traditional <laughs> for thinking about how do we want to approach our students and the learners in this uh, as whole children or as someone that's, you know, you're getting this lesson done. Check. So I, I just wanted to mention something um, about, uh, I guess, the past and the future of education. And I recognize that uh, we've been focusing, at least I think we've been focusing on public schools. Um, and given what's going on um, in terms of education, there are organizations and parent groups 
who are now um, taking the lead and trying to augment the uh, education that um, that they know their kids aren't going to get in some places. And so that's that's another, um, I think, opportunity or a challenge um, in terms of the kind of educational initiatives that that we've been talking about tonight. You know, it's something that certainly happened, um, you know, in the days of segregation and also at times when public schools were just under too much duress to provide a safe uh, education uh, for kids that parents sought other alternatives. And so um, I just wanted to uh, not leave them out. And, you know, it's coming back in the future. Yeah, good point. Any other questions or thoughts or comments? So, um, well then I wanna thank Lisa and Alicia and Stacy so much for um, bringing these um, projects and, and great insights um, to, uh, to this conversation. And um, and thank you all for coming. Um, like I said, we'll be sending you a recording of this, and then um, and then there there are other ones coming up um, in two weeks, and then in two weeks, and then in two weeks. So, and there are other ones too that if you're interested, look at that that link to the description because some of the other graduate programs have some pretty interesting um, webinars that are happening as well. So. Yeah. So if I could ask the my uh, 600 class to stick around um, 